Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. A couple things to mention before we get into the words for this evening. Keep in prayer the upcoming missions trip. I've mentioned, and I think most of you understand, that there is some uh, political, civil unrest in the nation of Kenya at this time. And you think, well, hey, it's, in, it's a sub-Saharan African continent, you know. <laughs> What's new? Uh, <clears throat> there have been some protests and some, some troubles uh, between uh, different uh, uh, political factions there. We're believing, Father, for uh, an opportunity to send a team, bring some good ministry to the churches there. It is, Jim and I were talking yesterday, it is such a special time, as you all know, for the churches there in Kenya to be visited by our group. It's, um, it literally is the highlight of their year. And it hasn't, we've not sent a team now for four years because of, uh, various factors and um, we're trusting father that um, here just about two weeks from tomorrow is it yeah we'll be able to send the team off with the Lord's blessing with his protection safety amen? amen keep it in prayer just that the Lord would give wisdom and that he would be honored and glorified in the time that the team has the minister there among our <clears throat> uh, among our churches there in Kenya and then also I wanted to mention the work day. We'll follow the same schedule that we did this past Saturday. Guys showing up at 8 and uh, ladies at 9.30. So looking to, to the Lord for another good time of fellowship there as well. Amen? Amen? Turn with me in your Bibles this evening back over to 1 Corinthians 13. We want to talk, continue to talk on the subject of love. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 13. We've taken some time. We started out last uh, service talking about how uh, we come to an understanding of a, a word through uh, usage, how it's used. Uh, on the subject of love, the Lord shows us what love is like. The Lord shows us who he is and what he is like. Amen? And of course, this passage in 1 Corinthians 13 as I trust all recognize, is not so much about the love that we have for Father as it is more directly speaking to the love that we have for one another. Jesus, of course, was asked, greatest commandment, thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. But he went on to answer the question that wasn't asked. That is the second one, right? What's the second greatest commandment? He told us, it's to love your neighbor as yourself. And we understand that those two are inseparable. John puts it very pointedly when he asks it, rhetorically, of course, how can you say you love God whom you've not seen when you don't love your neighbor whom you have seen? God joins those two. And what God has joined together, amen, let not man put us under. There are lies there in a problem in the lives of Christians, really all of us to some measure, because we say we love God and we have a desire to honor him with our all, but we don't always act in a Christ-like manner toward our brothers and sisters in a loving manner, in a God-like manner toward fellow human beings. And this passage is a passage of scripture addressing very specifically, very directly the subject of love, and it teaches us, the Lord teaches us, what love looks like and, of course, what it doesn't look like. The first two start out, love is patient, okay? And we could say charity is long-suffering or love is patient, and we've talked some along those lines. It bears long, doesn't it? Yep. How long? How long? How long? You know, sometimes in relationships, close relationships, I, you know, <clears throat> I tell you, it, it affects me uh, when you hear the word just out in secular society, some couple that has been married for, you know, 25, 30, 35 years 
they break up. And you think, how tragic. What is going on there? That people could have been in some measure, some level committed to one another for that long and then they, they part ways. What a testament to man's selfishness. What a lack of biblical love. Biblical love. In all fairness, in any relationships, there will, through the full course of the relationship, be things about the other party that we don't particularly like. Rub us wrong. We would, you know, we care about them, committed to them, but it sure would be nice if they would grow up some in this area, learn to do things a little bit uh, differently in that area. And that's just very characteristic of, of human relationships. Inside the body of Christ, outside the body of Christ. We're talking about in the church right now, among the people of God. It'll never go away. Understanding that, among the responses, uh, we, we're, we're in this for the long haul. We recognize, again, quite frankly, that the Lord uses that little thorn that somebody else is in my flesh to build the character of Jesus in me. Now, no, no. Yeah, yeah. We all know where we could go with that. And somebody, somebody, yep, yeah, okay, I'm just trying to be a blessing to you. I'm in no hurry to change my selfish, carnal ways because I know that the Lord is using it in your life to make you more like Jesus. But the truth is still there, isn't it? Yeah. And we are called upon by God to be long-suffering. Love is long-suffering. Love doesn't have its limits. I'll put up with this to this extent or for this long, but bless God, if they doesn't, it doesn't change in this time frame. It reminds me of a, of a, a, a situation uh, some dealings that we had had with an individual, a family. This is years ago and in Sterling. But there was a, um, an individual <clears throat> that had uh, been a part of the fellowship uh, for a long time in his family and left with his nose out of joint for wrong reasons. Sad. Uh, he ended up down the road at another church and, you know, appropriately, there was some contact between this other church and the leadership of the other church. <clears throat> And uh, we probably invested, you know, a good 20 plus years into this individual. And, and, uh, and the new pastor <laughs> says, we're going to give him, you know, we're going to give him, you know, five years. See if we can, you know, see this guy get turned around here. And it's, <laughs> it, was a, it was a pretty strange perspective. You know, somebody shows up the door and, okay, we see he's got some rough spots. But we'll give a go. Yeah, he literally said five years. <laughs> Okay, excuse me, where do we find five? Long suffering. <laughs> and we're reminded of how the Lord deals with us. He is very, very long suffering. Amen? Amen? Amen. So if ever you were to find a brother or a sister that uh, you considered to be an annoyance, an irritant, uh, uh, just uh, troubling, difficult to be around, uh, remember that love is long-suffering, long-suffering, without limitation. Jesus' attitude toward us is the standard. Amen? Uh, of course, <clears throat> love is kind. Love is kind. And we've taken a look at that. From the positive perspective, it's useful. It's employed. It's providing what is needful, acting benevolently kind. We've considered that kindness should be, we would rightly consider that the, the highest kindness, uh, the purest kindness that we could render a brother or a sister in the Lord would be to help them spiritually. Amen? To help them spiritually. Because frankly in the context of 1 Corinthians 13, 
We have really not profited anybody anything if we give them all that we could materially, naturally, and we've not moved in uh, love toward them. We've not helped them or benefited them spiritually. So make sure that we take that perspective. But then we went on and we talked of also, uh, you know, the Good Samaritan. Amen? Uh, he was ready to bring help of a very practical nature to a present, uh, an immediate need, something that was there before him. Without consideration given to the, the worthiness of the individual that was in need. Didn't have to be somebody that they knew or somebody that could uh, pay him back. Didn't have to be any of that. The person was in need and charity is kind and useful uh, irrespective of those other considerations. How deserving the individual is or whether I like them or whether they've been good to me in the recent past or there's the promise of maybe them being able to do some good for me in the future. No. Love doesn't take those factors into consideration at all, does it? No. So again, uh, in uh, the relationships that we have with one another, uh, we, don't consider about, we don't consider what that other person has done for me. Have they been good to me? Okay, well, you know, they invited me over for dinner, I'll invite them over for dinner. Those are the kinds of things that are spoken directly to in the scripture. Don't invite the people that can just invite you back. Amen? And we're reminded that God, our God, our Father, uh, and again, we remember that we, part, we are partakers of his nature. He's really teaching us to act in accordance with who we are, which is who he is. Amen? He's kind to the unthankful and to the evil, to the unworthy. So be ready to be kind. We could take some time. I, I'll, I'll just toss out the, the, the perspective because, you know, the 1 Corinthians 13 passage proceeds now to talk of uh, love and what it is not like, right? It's not envious. It, it doesn't boast, brag, not puffed up. We'll talk about those in just a few minutes. Uh, but we could consider uh, how love is not uh, impatient and love is not unkind. So if you were to characterize an attitude or an action as in any way unkind or impatient, you know you're not moving in love. Amen? If it's not kind, if it is unkind, then it's not the love of God. I, um, <clears throat> I'll, I'll just use a simple example. And I, and I do so because the Lord is, is always teaching us. But I was reminded of kindness. And, you know, the second verse that children are taught. First one, of course, is what? Children, children obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. But the second is what? Be ye kind one to another. Very good. That's, that's verse number two. Kids learn, right? Yeah. Well, this afternoon, a couple of little ones were, you know, putting some toys away. And one, you know, knowing that it was time to go and, um, and heard that it was time to go. Okay, we've got to pack it up. Just very deliberately kicked the creation that the other one had been working on. Because it's time to go. We've got to put all these toys away. Bam, there goes your stuff. Just like that. It's time to go, you know. It's got to be put away anyways. Can't continue to stay, build it, but just bam, kicked it. So I stopped the individual and talked with them about how they like to be treated and what Jesus has to say about being kind one to another and treating others the way uh, we would like to be treated because we're to uh, love our neighbor as ourselves, right? Is that kind? No. Would you like somebody to do that to you? No. no. Simple measure. So somebody rubs you wrong, 
And now you're going to, you know, you're going to make sure that you let them know that they rubbed you wrong by your attitude. Just, you know, you withdraw. Sort of standoffish. Is that the way you would like to be treated? So again, we can get a glimpse of what kindness looks like by considering what it doesn't look like. You with me there? So just as we uh, briefly review, those can be helpful standards. Because uh, <clears throat> remember, this is the uh, second greatest commandment, like the first. And if we think that we're moving in the love of God and we don't love our neighbor, then we're deceived. Or, again, if we were to refer to the language of 1 John, we're liars. We're liars. So if it's not kind, it's not patient, it's not the love of God. Let's move on. <clears throat> we'll read 4 through 8, or the first part of 8, and then we'll pick it up at envy. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, love never fails. That's the New King James. <clears throat> Envy, I shared this definition from Jonathan Edwards' writings there in our last time together as we were wading into a discussion of envy. Envy may be defined as a spirit of dissatisfaction with and opposition to the prosperity of others as compared with our own. In the same vein, it's a dislike for the comparative superiority of the state of honor or prosperity or happiness that another may enjoy over what <clears throat> I or he possesses. So it's that comparison, isn't it? Envy is making a comparison. They've got something better than, bigger than, nicer than, newer than. Envy. And it's not just, oh, isn't that nice? And mine, com by comparison, is, is, uh, is, is not as nice. No, I want what they got. They don't deserve to have better than me. They're no better than me. I'm, I'm, I'm at least as good. No, if we're going to be honest, I'm better than they are. I deserve it more than they do. I should have it. They should not have it. That's envy. Now, you might sit there and think, well, yeah, that's, that's ugly. I never give place to that kind of thought. We, we understand that in so many places in the scripture, the descriptions of evil are the descriptions of evil in its uh, fully blossomed form. We want to give no place to this kind of attitude whatsoever in our lives. Because a little leaven will leaven the whole lump, won't it? Any kind of resentment that somebody has something that, mm, why do they have it? I don't. Why does it have to be that way? And on and on. Of course, the, among the more obvious ones would be things material. Those are the kinds of things that people have to contend with. Yes? Yep. I would like, you know, what they have. Why do they have it? And, and it wouldn't necessarily be that, um, that, uh, <clears throat> that they got it the wrong way. Sometimes there's the, it, it's, it's a, a not-so-subtle complaint against God and his justice. Why did they get the breaks and I didn't? Why is their ship come in and mine sunk? Why, why is it that way? Sometimes in relationships, uh, people are envious, aren't they? They got a nice marriage. Mine's, 
Mine's been nothing but a ball and chain. Wish I had stayed single. And then you got single people envying the married people. Why do they, why do they why do, you know, I'm as good looking or I just, you know, as much going as, as they did, but they got married and I didn't. And people envy. The married people sometimes envy the single people. Single people marry the, uh, envy the uh, married people. And wicked stuff, isn't it? And it's in us. It's in us. Should be given no place. If, some, if it's going well for somebody, then Christians are taught to be glad for them. Amen? You got a brother or sister that's, that's doing well? Hey, praise God. Bless them, Lord. Proverbs 14.30 says that a sound heart is life to the flesh, but envy the rottenness of the bones. I brought that along because, again, there, you know, it, it speaks to <clears throat> how things can really eat you up from the inside out. Rottenness from within. We'll talk about discontent in just a minute, but that's a, that's a, a big factor, isn't it? We're not satisfied with what we have. We look upon what somebody else has got. They got a nicer uh, wife. Mine's not as nice. <laughs> not as nice as theirs. Or they got one. I don't. Just It's, um, it'll eat you up. It'll kill you from the inside out. Christians don't allow it, give any place to it. <clears throat> In Romans chapter 12, verse 15, the first part says, Rejoice with those who rejoice. Rejoice with those who rejoice. If it's going well for somebody, why should I resent that? Why should I <clears throat> be irritated by somebody else, somebody else being blessed, being well off? Rejoice with those who rejoice. Go with me over to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I know you were probably expecting, um, Jim, I, I promised that um, he'd be teaching here very soon on the Song of Solomon. You've already finished up that. We'll, we'll be hearing from him along that subject here real soon, I'm sure. He's taking a little extra time to prepare. <clears throat> Hallelujah. <clears throat> Seeing it was around the subject of love. He just said, man, what, what great time. We're reading through the Bible, Song of Solomon, teaching on the subject of love. Dad, can I... Okay, son. <laughs> In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 24, <clears throat> reads, Let no one seek his own, but each one the other's well-being. The envy seeks uh, what the others got for my own benefit. But <coughs> Christian love set over against envy seeks the well-being of others to the disregard of our own interests. Envy wants to get what somebody else has got for themselves, take it away from them so I have it. And of course, it's not just physically taking it away. No, it's, it's that, that attitude. Where I ought to have it. I deserve it. Deserve it more than everybody as much, no, more than they deserve it. Ought to have it. <clears throat> Look at me over to Psalm 73. Psalm 73. From verse 1, the psalmist writes, Truly, God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart. But as for me, 
My feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. For I was envious at the foolish when they saw the prosperity of the wicked, for there are no bands in their death. Their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, neither are they plagued like other men. Many would be familiar with Psalm 73 as David really tells on himself, doesn't he? He talks about how he looked upon the prosperity of the wicked and thought, here are these guys, they're wicked, and yet it seems like everything is going well for them. Doesn't seem fair. Here I am serving God, and I've got trouble and heartache and difficulty. I was envious, he says, at the wicked. Well, <clears throat> uh, what could possibly cause somebody to look upon somebody else's state, the honor that they receive, the, the prosperity that they walk in, the recognition that they have of men, the relationships that they enjoy, and be envious? Well, it's, it's surely found in not being content in Jesus, isn't it? Should we not be able to say, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want? When our confidence is in Jesus, who he is, the one who meets all our needs, we know that we have exactly what he'd have us enjoying or experiencing. Is there any power on earth capable of withholding a blessing that God intends you to have? Isn't that an important one to remember from time to time? No force in heaven or on earth can keep God from getting you exactly what he wants you to have exactly when he wants you to have it. Anybody bigger than God? More capable than God? More powerful? So why would I be envious at what somebody else has? I'm calling into question God's character, his provision for me. Of course, the psalmist, he goes on here. And uh, we drop down to verse 25. He says, whom have I in heaven but you? There is none upon earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. There are times when, yeah, our flesh and our hearts, <clears throat> they're not doing so well. But then God strengthens us, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. Yeah, he picks us up. He helps us get our focus where it ought to be, on Jesus, on the Lord, on his goodness. He reminds us that he's our portion. He's really all we have need of. What somebody else has or doesn't have, what I have, don't have, God's my portion. Is there anything that can separate you from the love of God? Do you really believe that? Do you walk in an awareness of the love of God? Is that precious to you? See, it's only when, when the love that the Lord has for us uh, is lightly esteemed. That is, we, when we uh, devalue the love of God. We become discontent, don't we? We're looking for something other than our Lord to satisfy us, which is an impossibility. And God teaches us that from time to time, doesn't he? Yeah. Just like the psalmist writes here and plenty other places. <clears throat> Difficulty and hardship come along, and we're taught to be fully content in Jesus. We're reminded that he is our portion. And there's really nothing on earth that we desire beside him. 
He teaches us to be fully content in him. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 11 says, Not that I speak in respect of want. He had been talking with the people about, about uh, giving and receiving, commending them for their faithfulness to sow into the ministry and support it financially. But he says, not that I speak in respect of one, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. We're talking about envy. Looking upon what somebody else has and considering it in light of what we don't have and resenting them or the circumstances. Somebody else has been honored and I've not been. I've been overlooked. I've been shown disrespect, perhaps. Or at the very least, I've not been noticed at all. When I'm laboring just as hard, serving just as faithfully, but somebody else gets the promotion, somebody else gets the recognition, somebody else gets the praise. Why is that? Why are you asking that? Who did you do it for? Who is it done unto? Do you doubt that the Lord takes notice? You probably, if you're reading through your Bible according to this plan, then you would have read there very recently in Hebrews chapter 6. The Lord is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love which you've showed toward his name. And you've ministered to the saints and do minister. Amen? God's not unrighteous to forget. Were you looking for the praise of man? Were you looking for the honor that comes from man? Bible's plain on that subject, isn't it? Jesus says that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination to God, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So who do we do or for whom do we do what we do? And if we get overlooked, somebody didn't notice us, give us the praise, the recognition, the honor that we thought we might have got coming or they got, why didn't we? It's an occasion for us to remember, consider, why we're doing what we're doing, for whom we are doing it. Amen? Amen. I don't speak in respect of want. I've learned in whatever state, whatsoever state I am in, therewith to be content. Dropping down. <clears throat> uh, well, <clears throat> he says, verse 12, I know both how to be abased, how to abound, everywhere and in all things I'm instructed to be full, to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. And then drop with me down to verse 19. God's the source, isn't he? My God shall supply all your need. Do you believe that? Amen. Do you believe that the Lord supplies all needs? Spirit, soul, and body. Not just materially. Oh, contextually he might be talking about uh, natural or material needs. But our God provides all that we have need of spirit, soul, and body. All. Envy proceeds from a heart that is discontent with what Jesus has provided. What I have isn't good enough. It's not enough. It's not as good as what somebody else has. <clears throat> Let us be content. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> Let's move on from envy. Love does not parade itself. Love does not parade itself. King James, love vaunteth not itself. Doesn't boast. Doesn't brag. Doesn't praise oneself excessively. Frankly, any praise of self seems excessive, doesn't it? Proverbs 27, verse 2. Do you know that one? Proverbs 27, verse 2. Anybody? You'll notice as soon as we you'll notice as soon as you start reading it. Let uh, another yeah you got it. Let another man praise thee. I know you were um, you were hesitant to raise your hand and and so I might have. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I know that one. I know them all. <laughs> yeah, you're a sharp bunch. Didn't get anybody on that one. Let another man praise thee, and not thine own mouth, a stranger, and not thine own lips. Uh, there are people that are good at what they do, but there's something uh, rather distasteful or, or uh, 
even repulsive at times, about that person letting you know about how good they are. They might be very good, but it's not their business to talk about how good they are, is it? No? That's, that's uh, uncomely. Well, certainly love doesn't uh, uh, boast and brag and, uh, and talk about how, how good they are. But, you know, <clears throat> uh, Pastor, we're not talking about professional athletes. Uh, we're talking about Christians and Christian conduct. Where does this stuff find its place in, in our lives? Well, you get people that, yeah, Christians that are sometimes a little bit too impressed with themselves. And they want to talk about how spiritual they are. How about that? How plainly unspiritual it is for somebody to talk about how spiritual they are. But it happens, doesn't it? It does. And people, you know, just, and, and of course, it gets cloaked sometimes because we're, we, we know that we shouldn't be uh, tooting our own horn. <clears throat> but it just hasn't been tooted as much as it needs to be. And somebody's got to step up to the plate. I guess I'm the man to, it about goes that way sometimes, doesn't it? And it's really all for the glory of God because really I, I, I just want to testify of how good, how mightily the Lord has been using me lately. The humility that he's been teaching me. It's just an amazing thing how, how, how humble I've been and, and how, how mightily, how, how God has so purified me and pur purged me of, 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 of self and I've just been, been used so mightily. He's revealing himself to me so, so gloriously and, and um, he's showing me all these things and, he's, and, and, and I just praise God uh, for all the great ways in which he's using me. Yeah. Glory to God. <laughs> yeah, I got that, yep. <laughs> And we all get, we, we, yeah, we get that and we hear that from time to time. Not much, but it sort of squeezes out from time to time when somebody's a little bit uh, too impressed with themselves. Love's not that way. Love's, love's not impressed with self. If God is doing something in us, then, uh, then it's the result of an encounter with God. You with me there? If, if God's doing a work in us, it's because we've had time in his presence. We've heard his voice. We've had, we've had an encounter with God. And if there is one thing that an encounter with God will do, a, do in a soul, it is humble them. Amen? Amen? Time in the presence of God. Somebody doesn't come out of the presence of God feeling big about themselves. On the contrary, it's like Isaiah Woe is me. I'm undone. Isaiah didn't go around both. Hey, wait till you tell you about the vision that I had, boys. I saw him high and lifted up. His train was filling the temple. I was front row seat. <laughs> Encounter with God, it's woe is me. Woe is me. Somebody's heard from God, close to God. Closer somebody gets to God, more humble they become. Less mindful of self they are. Less likely it is they're going to have anything to say about their greatness, their accomplishments, their spirituality, their maturity, how mightily they're being used. Love doesn't brag or boast. Uh, doesn't, uh, isn't impressed with self. And you think, well, okay, um, <clears throat> but how is that an, an aspect or a dimension of love? Well, <clears throat> uh, it really does put other people off, for starters, doesn't it? You with me there? Yeah. And, uh, and what edif love edifies, love edifies, doesn't it? Love builds up. But when somebody wants to talk about self rather than God, and you know it's not always a totally altogether about self. We're talking in spiritual circles. We're talking about people that, that want to talk about self, but they want to sanctify it. And so we'll talk about mostly about God, but we'll talk about, yes, we'll slip a little bit of me in there so that, it, you know, that this testimony reflects favorably on me. You with me there? Yes, God did this mighty work. 
but his humble servant was the one through whom he did it. And uh, that's just, that's just uh, the fly in the ointment, isn't it? Yeah? It sort of spoils what could have been really God-honoring. And that's not love, is it? No, no. We want God to get all the glory, don't we? All the, all the glory, all glory to God. <clears throat> Second Corinthians chapter 10, verse 17. But he who boasts is to boast in the Lord. For it is not he who commends himself that is approved, but he whom the Lord commends. If there's some commendation, let it come from the Lord. Or like we read over there in Proverbs, you know, maybe let another man praise you. But not self, not self. In Daniel chapter 4, just one for your notes. <clears throat> 26 through 33, I'm going to read from the New King James. It says, <clears throat> uh, Daniel has interpreted Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Now the great tree is going to be cut down. We'll pick it up at verse 26. Inasmuch as they gave the command to leave the stump and roots of the tree, your kingdom shall be assured to you or restored to you after you come to know that heaven rules. Therefore, O king, let my advice be acceptable to you. Break off your sins by being righteous and your iniquities by showing mercy to the poor. Perhaps there will be a lengthening of your prosperity. So this is Daniel interpreting Nebuchadnezzar's dream. You can go and read it in its entirety, but... I, you know, I think I've got most of you. <clears throat> All this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of 12 months, so he's been warned, he's the great tree and this thing is going to be hewn down. At the end of 12 months, he was walking about the royal palace of Babylon. The king spoke saying, is not this Great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling in my mighty power and for the honor of my majesty. While the word was still in the king's mouth, a voice fell from heaven. King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken. The kingdom has departed from you and they shall drive you from men and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make you eat grass like oxen and seven times shall pass over you until you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomever he chooses. That very hour, the word was fulfilled concerning Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from men and ate grass like oxen. His body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hair had grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws. Just became insane wild man. Because he's boasting in himself. Warned of God. God knows how to bring somebody down. God knows that no flesh should be glorying in his presence. No flesh should be glorying. Love doesn't boast. When a Christian's moving in the love of God, they're mindful of how great God is. And they just, if they, if they have anything to say of a boastful nature, it's how good he is, how, how good their, their father is, and how wonderful he is in his, all, all his works. Nothing to do with self at all. Nope. And when we're sharing the good news of what the Lord is doing, and God's honored and glorified, we're not. Amen? Verse 6 of Proverbs 20 most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness, but a faithful man who can find. We've got a few minutes left, and I'm going to move on to uh, love not being puffed up. You bear with me just a few more minutes. For your notes, 1 Corinthians 8.1. 1 
the latter part of the verse says, knowledge puffs up, love edifies. Whole verse now, concerning things offered to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, love edifies, or love builds up. Amen? Amen. Love is not puffed up. Uh, the uh, <clears throat> vaunting self is sort of the outward. Uh, puffed up is just being, having uh, an inflated self-image. And when we're moving in the love of God, that's just not there. Amen? Love <clears throat> does not, uh, is not puffed up. Here it says that knowledge can puff up. Maybe you can know some things. Maybe you, you, you've got some, some information. Maybe you've uh, you got some things working. But if it's not working by love, then it's of no value at all. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Love edifies. Look at me at 1 Corinthians chapter 4. This really nails it on the head. Look with me first to verses 1 and 2. 1 Corinthians 4. Let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. So Paul says, the way I should be viewed as just, is as a servant, just a servant, Right? One to whom something has been given. There's been a, a, a trust that has been bestowed. Paul considers himself to be just a steward. Didn't originate in him, did it? Nope, just, he's just a steward of what has come from God. He goes down, you can pick it up with me at verse 6. Now these things, brethren, I have figuratively transferred to myself and Apollos for your sakes. Just truths that would pertain to being stewards. That it may learn in us not to think beyond what is written. That none of you be puffed up on behalf of one against the other. So he says, uh, listen, we're just servants. I and Apollos, we're just servants. And that's the way you should view us. That's the way we view ourselves. That's the way you should view yourselves. That you may learn in us not to think beyond what is written. Verse 7. Who makes you to differ from another? And what do you have that you did not receive? Now, if you did indeed receive it, why do you boast as though you had not received it? Is there something working in you from a spiritual perspective? Some maturity, some depth of character. Uh, you're, you've learned to be a little bit more kind and long-suffering. Uh, you learn to be a little bit more selfish and selfless in relationships. Uh, you got some things that are genuinely working. How is it working? Why is it working? Is it from any other source other than Christ in you? Is it something other or apart from, outside of the relationship with the Lord? If you're Christ-like, it's because God did it in you. Is that, is that plain? Is that simple? So where is boasting then? If you are Christ-like, you, you got something working in you. There's a faithfulness, there's a steadiness, there's a steadfastness, there's a consistency, there's a boldness, there's some power, whatever it might be. What do you have that you did not receive from God? And if you received it, why are you so impressed with it? It's God. It's just God. Amen? Amen. Love's not puffed up. Again, love is not impressed with self. We talked about bragging. Well, this is just the attitude, isn't it? The attitude that's behind bragging. Being impressed with self. No, the Christian understands that 
I, by, it's by the grace of God that I am what I am. Amen? Amen. And if his grace is working in you mightily, to God be the glory. We don't get puffed up. We don't get overly impressed with self about that. No. No, again, uh, encounter with God results in greater humility. Greater humility. The closer a soul walks with God, the less they, the less they are impressed with self. What do you have that you didn't receive? Love is not puffed up. You could jot down for your notes on this. <clears throat> the Philippians chapter 2 passage, where we're, we're taught to let this mind be in us, which was also in Christ Jesus. Amen? He had, uh, he had grounds for boasting, but he didn't go around just uh, proclaiming his own goodness, did he? No. He was not overly impressed with himself. <clears throat> From our perspective, or for us, yes, we understand that anything that we have, anything that has been done in us of a spiritual nature, anything that is, that is a Christ-likeness, Christ-like about our, our character, any goodness, any strength, it's from the Lord. We, give, we acknowledge that and give God thanks for it. And it really is that simple. Giving to the Lord the glory to his name. So love is patient and love is kind. Love does not envy. It doesn't boast or vaunt itself. And it's not puffed up, is it? No. So Holy Spirit, I trust, will continue to use these truths as he purges and purifies our hearts and really purifies the, the love that we have for him and for one another, for our brothers and sisters in the Lord. Let's keep our eyes on Jesus, amen? amen. And allow him to do his good work in us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you that we are indeed stewards of your grace, your goodness, your gifts. You are in fact, conforming us to the image of Jesus. But that's not because of any goodness that is inherent. That's because we're new creatures in Christ Jesus. Old things have passed away and all things have become new. We make our boast in you. We sing of your goodness. And when... In your goodness and mercy, you purge and purify. And we say thanks. We appreciate the, the care, the love that you show as you deal with us as with sons. Thank you, Father God. Teach us to love to love one another as you love us, O oh Lord God, to be very long-suffering, to be kind, to give no place to thinking more highly of ourselves than we ought to think, to be content. We thank you, Father God. Trust you for that good work, Lord, in Jesus' name. Let's stand together and minister to the Lord in song. Hallelujah. Thank you, O oh Lord Jesus. What a precious promise, O oh Lord, that you will never leave us, never forsake us. You are ever a present help, O oh Lord God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father God. Bless now these, your people, O oh Lord God. Cause your face to shine upon them and give them your peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We'll be sure and greet one another in the love of the Lord. As grace and peace go with you all.